So if you have uh, your Bible, um, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians. I say that. We're actually not going to be 1 Thessalonians. You can turn to Acts. But we are starting a series in 1 Thessalonians. And if you haven't been here why we go through the book of the Bible, we just pick a book and we go line by line through the Word of God, because as we read the Word of God, it doesn't come back vain. It actually uh, will shape you into the character of Christ if you receive it. And so we believe in the power of the Word of God. And so that will be for some time. Until we finish First Thessalonians, um, the, the sermon title this morning, if you're keeping notes, is The Persuasion uh, of Christ. The Persuasion of Christ. And so a few uh, just background about the book of First Thessalonians. As you start in any book, you should probably know who the author is, what's going on. So to set the stage of First Thessalonians, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. He planted the, uh, the, the church in Thessalonica on, on his second missionary journey. The reason why he's writing this letter uh, is because he had to leave very quickly. We'll actually read that in 17 uh, at the beginnings of the church in Thessalonica. And he was writing them to encourage them, to inform them, to strengthen them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, because he had to leave prematurely. And it's almost a book that kind of didn't happen because he keeps on writing. He's like, I'm trying to get to you. I'm trying to get to you. He just was never able to get to them. So it's so amazing. He's being encouraged, or this church is being encouraged by the word of Christ. And we get to uh, through, through that. So Paul's writing uh, this church that he, he, he planted or started. Uh, when it was written, it was around A.D., 49 to 51, so after Jesus Christ's death from 49 to 51 during, like I said, that second, uh, second missionary journey, where Th- Thessalonica is the capital city of, the, uh, of a Roman um, uh, region called Macedonia. So it's the capital city. It was a big city, 100 to 200,000 uh, people were in this city. It's one of the larger cities. It was located as a port city. So a port city means a lot of access for resources and, and people. And with that, there's a level of prosperity, but also uh, there's also many, um, many gods adopted in that area. And, and the reason for that, there's a lot of people. So there's a kind of known as a pantheon uh, of religions. It's kind of accepting of all gods, of all people. If there's a God of that God, they build a temple or whatever. Um, so it's a very inclusive culture, not unlike what we see today. Uh, we have freedom of religion here, which, man, I support. But with that, uh, there's a lot of uh, different ideas about God and how to, to, worship, um, to worship him. So that gives you a little bit of background of First Thessalonians and just Thessalonica. We're, like I said, we're not going to, you naturally think, all right, let's open to Thessalonians. We're not going to start there. We're starting Acts. So if you have your Bible, grab that, Acts. And um, we're going to start, you can turn to 16. I'm going to start in Acts 1. We'll, we'll spend some time in 16 and 17. The reason why we're starting in the book of Acts is written as the Acts of the Apostles. I think a, a better way to write that is the Acts of the Holy Spirit because this is the history of the church being formed. Like, so this is the, if you ever wonder like, man, I wonder where the church started, it's here. It's, Acts was started here. It's the uh, beginning of the church. It's the beginning of the Thessalonian church, the beginning. Um, it's what we're caught up in here as the door, the door church. So um, what I'm going to read is Acts 1.8 is what Jesus says. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So leave that on screen for a second. What happens here, Jesus is talking. He's risen from the grave at this point and he's telling his apostles, you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit and the purpose of of the Holy Spirit is one, I mean, it brings you into a right relationship with God through Jesus, but secondly, to be a witness to who Jesus Christ and what he has done to Jerusalem, to all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think a lot of times we look at the Holy Spirit as very mystical. Like it gives you like superhuman powers and maybe to fly or do different things. It says right here, the primary role of the Holy Spirit is to, man, man, to, to really justify sinners, uh, but secondly, that we can witness to who Jesus Christ is. It's the, the building of the church of God is done by the, the Holy Spirit. And we're supposed to be a witness uh, to everyone, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. How do we do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. The primary role here, as we see as the church unfolding, is to man, make and equip the church of God to be a witness It tells us our role here too. He's telling the apostles, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to witness to who Jesus is and what he has done. 
Um, we're supposed to be a, 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 a testifier to this is true about Jesus. So I don't know if you've ever thought about that. He's telling these disciples, I want you to be a testifier to truth about who I am. And as people understand that, they become the church and this mission goes forward to everyone. Everyone needs Jesus. And I want you to be a witness to them. Now, he's telling the apostles this. This is the beginning of the church. This is also, if you're a Christian, that means what? You've repented of sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been born of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is now, man, wanting and allowing you to witness to other people. If you call yourself a Christian, this is our mission, individually and corporately. We're supposed to what? To be witnesses and be going out. And there's two parts I want us to see what we're caught up in, that the church of Thessalonica is caught up in, that what we're caught up in that we're supposed to own this mission, witnesses of Jesus Christ. There's two primary ways I want us to think about our witness. Being a witness of Jesus Christ is saying that we are his representatives. It says in in Corinthians that we are are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, that we're embassy. We're an embassy to show what Christ is like, that he is our Savior and Lord, that he's our King. And like I said, I want us to think about this individually. You, if you're a Christian, People should look at you and they should look at our church as a whole and look and see what? Christ. They should see the character of Christ in you and in us. That we are loving, that we are joyful, that we desire to bring healing as he has brought healing to us, that we want to be a place of refuge and safety for people as Jesus Christ is for us, that we should be merciful, we should be forgiving, we should be a very generous people, we should be strong, We should be truthful. We should be doers of good. Jesus says, as a witness, that we are a light to to the world, that we're a beacon of what his future kingdom looks like. He says, I am the king and I am returning. And this church gets to be a witness to the world. This is what the character and nature of Christ looks like. That's why we're called what? The body of Christ. Would you say that's some of your characters? Is that your attributes? Is that something that you're known for? It should be as a witness of Christ. Um, I have a, a desire, being an embassy, that we are a place of refuge and healing for people, uh, that we are a place that shows a, the generosity of Christ corporately, that if our church shut down, that people would be sad about it, if they go here or not. Why? Because we, we're a place of refuge. They may not agree with God or what we say, but may, you know what? We see the good works and we're glorifying God in heaven. That there are generous people. There are kind people. Our city is a better city because of that, those people. That, that's, what we should, that's a witness of who our Lord and Savior is, Jesus Christ. Now, that, that's the embassy, a place of refuge and healing. Now, the, the other part of being a witness is we should be an outpost. Like, Jesus gave them a mission. You should be a witness. You go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That means we, you, should have a mission to be a witness to your world. That means you go into your families, and your mission is what? To be a witness to Jesus Christ. That means you go into your schools, and you be a witness for Jesus Jesus Christ, into your workplace, into the communities. See, there's a ripple effect as we see ourselves as an outpost. I mean, we're taking enemy ground is our, our goal. We're in a spiritual battle that Christ is victor and we're pushing back enemy ground. That's how we should think. Do you think that way? That God has strategically put me into people's life to be an outpost for the kingdom, to bear this, the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for them. There's a ripple effect as that happens. Man, as you start to witness where you're at, man, it starts to go out. And that's what he says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. You know what he says? Start right in front of your face. And be a witness. And as you do that, you'll see the kingdom of God spread. Our partners, so we have a partners ministry at the Door Church, or a, I, you know, as I was thinking about it, we have a, a man, Jesus Christ witnessing uh, uh, um, strategy is, is Acts 1-8. We want to see Jesus exalted here. I mean, we want to be a witness in Louisville, and Capel, and Carrollton, and Flower Mount. We want to be a witness Man, in word and deed to our area, our Jerusalem, we want to see it go out to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We long for that. 
we have 17 uh, really witnesses that we're, we're planning with strategically. We send 100, we're planning on sending $150,000 out, man, to this this year. And Lord willing, I pray that's millions of dollars as we grow. Why? Because we're passionate about, man, the rule and reign of Christ going to the nations. And what's so amazing as this outpost minister, we have these witnesses from Oklahoma to Southeast Asia, to the West Coast of the U.S., to the West Coast of Africa. What's so amazing, the sun cannot go down on the witnessing of the Door Church and our partners. And I, that's it. we're just one small element. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the water covers the seas. And this is what we're caught up in. That's why we're starting here. Do you understand what's going on? When we gather, we're an embassy, we're a refuge. And then we go out to be an outpost to take enemy ground. This is the disciples' mission. Is that your mission? It certainly is the Door Church mission. If you call this their home, we want you to embody it. We want you to love it. Now, how does that look like? It tells us in Acts 2. So they received this word from Jesus. We want, I want you to have the power to be a witness by the power of the Holy Spirit to go make disciples to the nations. And then Pentecost happens. That's in chapter 2. So they get this word. The Holy Spirit, man, gives them this power to be a witness. And then Peter gets up at Pentecost. And Pentecost we're not getting all that means, but a whole bunch of Jewish people are going in. So there's a big audience and he, what? He's a witness. He preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're like, what is that? Well, it says in Acts 2, verse 37 and 38, at the end of his witnessing of sharing of Christ, it'll be up on the screen. It says, uh, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Those people hearing about Jesus says, man, they, they felt, man, I need this. There's a conviction here. And as they felt the need and truthfulness of what they're saying to the witness of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done, he said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? And he said, and Peter said to them, repent. That means turn. Turn from your ways and trust Jesus. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of who? Jesus. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, you need Jesus. The gospel message is actually super simple. You're like, what is, how do I be a witness? The truth is, Peter's saying, we're all sinners. We all stand condemned. We're guilty. But the good news is Jesus Christ has stepped in and is our substitute. He's our Savior. And you can receive him and have the forgiveness of your sin. And you too can be born of the Holy Spirit. You too can have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. That's the witness. It's pretty simple that you and I, are needy. Peter didn't get up and say, y'all are needy. He says, we're all needy. And the good news, Jesus Christ has met our deepest need, that we need a right relationship that we can never have. And it says 3,000 that day were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit as they met Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 3,000 as they bore witness. This is what we're witnessing. And that was the first church as he witnessed to who Jesus is and what their deepest need was. And Jesus Christ had met their need for forgiveness and healing and transformation or righteousness they could never have on their own. Now, what's so great is that is the message. A lot of us don't like to look at our neediness. We're gonna talk more about that here in a second. Know why? Because that confronts you and me with ourselves. And that's hard, but that's the gospel message. It says you are needy, that you are sick ridden with sin and the consequences are bad. It's separation from God, it's eternal punishment, it's death. But the good news, Jesus Christ stands to save you. Why? Because he took on your sin. He knelt it to the cross. You're forgiven and you can have eternal life because Jesus Christ has taken your condemnation. Now, I'm gonna go on record and tell you something. This is not easy and I go to our spiritual need, to our physical need. I don't like going to the doctor. Like 0%. My wife was here in the first service. She laughed because she knows it's true. I don't like it. Know why? I'm afraid they're going to tell me something really bad. I'm afraid they'll be like, you know what? This is bad news. It's everywhere. And then I'm also, as they tell me this bad news, and he's like, and we don't know what to do about it. Right? That's what I'm really scared of. Well, that's kind of what the gospel does. It's really bad news. But the good news, we have a great physician. He's like, I know what to do about it. I'm going to take that sin I'm going to take that punishment. He is a remedy. He is a healer. So he doesn't confront you to condemn you. He confronts you to heal you, heal you and comfort you. He is kind in that. That's why he's come. And that is the gospel message. When people receive Jesus Christ and that remedy and that healing, they're the church. 
Sinners become sons. Sinners become daughters. And they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to have a right relationship with God and now to be witnesses. This is the first church. This is the history of the Thessalonica church. It's the history of our church. It's what we're caught up in. Any biblical church has one mission. It's to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a church that doesn't have that mission is not a church. They may gather, but they're not a church. The church is built on Christ alone. And our mission has always been the same for the past eight years. It's very simple. Man, we want to see restored lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ for God's glory. The big idea, everyone's a sinner and they need Jesus. That's what Jesus said. This is how the church is formed and is sustained. And when the church has a mission, you know what happens? The church multiplies. It grows. You know what? It's also unified, right? A churches that have disunification, you know why? They have a mission problem. I'm not saying everyone likes our mission, but they're not going to stay here that long. But everyone that loves our mission, there's a unification. This is why we exist, and there's movement. This is what unifies churches, the mission of Jesus Christ to go be witnesses to our worlds and to the nations. Now, Acts 16 picks up on the church of Thessalonica being born. So you have this history and the movement of Acts going forward as the apostles and disciples are sharing the gospel as being witnesses. In Acts 16, we come to the Macedonian call. And if you're listening to the, the beginning, Macedonia is the region, uh, the Roman region of where Thess- Thessalonica is. It's actually the capital of that area. And I'm going to read 6 through 10. It says, And they went through the region of, of Phygra and Galatia, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak in the word in Asia. And they had come up to Mysa. They attempted to go to uh, Bithany, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysa, they went down to Trous. Now listen to verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. That's where Thessalonica is. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel, to be a witness there. So what is he saying? Paul felt he was called to go to Macedonia to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be a witness to Jesus Christ. Now he has a conviction in his call. There are people in Macedonia who I'm supposed to witness to come to Christ. And so he was very steadfast in his steps. He was faithful in his steps. He was confident in his witnessing. What I didn't say, it was gonna be easy. He actually got ran out of town. But man, he, was, he, he witnessed faithfully. And what happened? It says that many came to know Christ in that city. I want us to have that same conviction in our call in our life, that God has called you and I to be witnesses. And he wants to use you to bring the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ, the salvation of Jesus Christ, the people that desperately need it. Do you have that conviction in your life? It's not gonna be easy. But man, do you live your life with that conviction? Because I want you to hear something. God desires to save. God desires people's forgiveness. He desires relationship with people. I I, I need you to hear something. God desires to give people mercy. We got to believe that if we're going to be faithful witnesses. It says in this, John 3, 16, most people know this verse. For God so loved the world. He loves this world. He loves the image bearers of this world that he gave his son, that whoever would believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You hear that? God doesn't want people to perish. He wants to save them. Why? Because Jesus Christ has come, and he died the death that we all deserve. Man, he's paid our debt. He's absorbed the wrath of God. He's taken the judgment. Why? So we can have eternal life. God longs for relationships with people through his son. He desires mercy. Do you believe that? Man, there's a conviction as we go that he wants a relationship with people. In 2 Peter 3.9, it says this. 2 Peter 3.9? Maybe? There it is. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all 
should reach repentance. The conviction that God wants people to reach repentance. He doesn't want to condemn. He doesn't want to have people perish. He gave his son so we wouldn't have to. See, I think a lot of us like, oh, you know what? God's up there. He's okay with what we're doing. You know what? He's slow. We think that God is approving of sin. Listen, don't be confused. His patience is not approval. I mean, the death of a son is crystal clear he's not okay with sin, and there will be judgment. But I think a lot of us see his loving kindness and patience as he's okay with it. And he's, he's saying, I long for mercy. I long for people to turn from sin and be saved. I hope someone here is listening at this morning. He's not okay with your sin. Don't think he's not just ignoring it, but he longs for your repentance and salvation. As we, as we look at the conviction of call, we know that his, that is his heart. Um, the second thing I want us to look at is there's conviction as we see, man, God desires mercy. He says, go to these people. They need Jesus. It says this in the middle of, uh, at the end of nine, there's a man of Macedonia standing there talking to Paul, urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. This Macedonian man saying, help us. Uh, I think this is very important because he's saying, what, I need help. Now, I'm gonna let you know something. I, I, in my natural flesh, I am allergic to that word help. Like, I hate it. Like, in myself, I don't, I don't ever want to admit I need help. Know why? Because that means I'm helpless. That means I can't help myself. And that means I'm needy. That means I'm, I'm dependent. When you ask for help, that means I'm not in control. I need someone else's help. Like, it's out, out of my ability. Um, asking for help is a, uh, not a position of strength. It's a, a position of weakness, and I don't like to be found in those places. I'm just being honest with you. So as this guy's crying for help, like everything in me is like, I don't like that. Um, when people tell me I can't, I mean like, well, I, I, I can and I will, right? I, I just, that's my natural bent. I like to think of myself as physically able. I like to think of myself as men mentally stable and strong. Emotionally, I don't, I don't like to think I can be rattled. Spiritually, I like to think I'm, I'm okay. I'm not the best, but I'm, I'm pretty good. That's how I like to think about myself. I'm gonna tell you something, Jesus didn't come for the well. Who'd he come for? The sick. And I'm not saying some are well. See, it's God's grace when he shows you your brokenness. I, what I didn't just say is that God has to break you. You're already broken because of sin. It's when God reveals you your brokenness that what? You say, I need help. For me, that came in college. Man, I, I, I grew up in the church, went, went to you know, royal ambassadors, I knew the Bible. You know, but man, I was proud. I didn't think I needed Jesus. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was better than everyone else. And it wasn't until college, man, that God broke me. Again, he allowed me to see my brokenness that I wouldn't admit. Man, he took, he took my health away. I broke my foot. I took the sport that I loved away. That was my identity. My relationships were failing. Spiritually, I was struggling to quit things that I know I shouldn't be doing. Broken. And all God was saying is, you need help. It was the most gracious thing that God has ever done to me. Because I got on my knees and said, God, I need help. You know what he did? Man, he, he gave me mercy. He gave me grace. Have you ever cried for help? That is the most godly prayer that you can pray. You are broken. And what happens as you meet Jesus and you experience the help and provision, the healing that comes in Christ... Man, one, there's joy and he changes you. But secondly, there's empathy. See, Paul was a proud man. He thought, you know, he says, I'm, you know, as for Jews, I was a Jew of Jews, right? He just goes on to list how awesome he was. Righteous, I was under the law, perfect. Then on the way, man, God struck him down and, and blinded him. Showed him he was not perfect. He was help and he came to Christ. And he usually breaks proud people and brings great empathy into their heart. Why? So they'd be good witnesses, right? He, he broke me, and I'm, I'm one of those proud human beings you'll ever meet. Why? Because there's now compassion. 
Have, if, you, if you experience the joy and the truth of your salvation recently, you'll have great empathy for people that are hurting and broken and needy and sinners. Why? Because you're just like them. And you'll want them to meet the Savior that has saved you. Now, moving on, he goes down and there's conviction that calls. So he's faithful. Go down to Thessalonica in verse seven, or chapter 17, verse 1. This is where the church is planted. And this is the message that he brought to the people. In verse 1, it says, Now when they had passed through the Amphilus and the Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of Jews, a pantheon of religions. There's Jewish people there. And, and Paul went in, and as his custom, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from scriptures. That's the Bible. So he gets the Bible, starts reasoning with them, explaining them and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying this, uh, uh, and, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as it did great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So what he did, he went to the Jewish synagogue, right? And, or, and he was like, this Bible that you're following is all about Jesus. You're not good on your own. You're sinners who need the Savior and that Savior is Jesus. And it says that many we're persuaded. See, I look at this, and this is my heart, because I grew up in church, but I was near Christ, but I wasn't in Christ. I was, says, I was a part of the people of God, but I wasn't one of the people of God. And this is the same thing for people that are Jewish. They have high morals. They, are, they have the, the promises of the law. They, have, they thought they were establishing a righteousness of their own. They had high reputation. There's elitism. We are, the, we are the people. And Paul's saying, no, you need Jesus. And it says many of them came. And I think that's a lot of what I see in our South. It's a Christless Christianity. We're moral people. We're better than them out there. I know the word of God, but do you know what it says? That you're a sinner who desperately needs to be healed in Christ. See, I mean, that was my idea about Christianity. I was like, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm close. I'll say a prayer for the sins, but man, I'm doing pretty good to establish my own little thing going. I'm righteous on my own. And that's not Christianity. See, Jesus came to pay for your sin, but to give you a righteousness not your own. And I'm telling you, you can be near Christ and not in him. If you've never repented of your righteous acts, your works, and come to Christ alone, you're not a Christian. You have not only to see that you need the forgiveness of your sin, which Christ willingly shed his blood for. You need a righteousness not your own. And you need to cry for help. Have you ever cried for help? Have you ever thought about this? He's coming to the people that are the nearest to God and says, you're close, but you're not in Jesus. That's what makes you a Christian. I've often said, and I'm quoting an uh, old hymn, just, you, we come, we lay our deadly doings down. We lay them down at Jesus' feet so we can stand in him alone. In him alone, glory is complete. It says that in Matthew 5, 3, and I think it's the most revolutionary verse. Blessed are who? The poor in spirit. Not the blessed are the people who are walking in righteousness on their own. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the helpless, the needy, the people that know they're not well. Blessed are those people. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of God. Do you understand your neediness? You're spiritually bankrupt. You have nothing before God. But when you come to see that, you see he gave his son. So what? We can have the kingdom of God, heaven. That's how you come. And as we sang earlier, in Christ alone. Have you come in Christ alone? Have you cried help? Are you stubborn? Thinking you've got this, you're not Okay. Man, have you, have you knelt down and asked God for that forgiveness and the rights that only his, his son can give? Now, I want to tell you this. I want you to come to experience the joy of salvation, forgiveness, and rights that comes in Christ alone. I'm, the only thing that stands between you and God you know what that is? The only thing that stands between you and God. It's not the, the heinous sins that you've done, the things that you won't tell people. It's not the only thing that will stand between you and God is you. That's it. 
You're the only thing that will prevent you from coming. Jesus has removed sin by laying down his life and shedding his blood to cover it. He's giving you a righteousness that you can ever earn to clothe you as you come. But the question is, will you come? Will you cry for help? It, that is the most godly prayer you could pray is, God, help me. Know why? You know say? He says, I already have in my son, Jesus Christ. And you will receive the forgiveness and love of the Father that Christ has earned for you. You'll be clothed in his righteousness. You pray help. The prayer has already been answered and you, the Christ will flood your heart and your life. Have you come? Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help us respond by your spirit, that you quicken our hearts to help us show the truth of Christianity as we reason through scripture. It's all about our need for Christ and the truth of Christ that he came and he lived and died and rose again so we could be made sons and daughters. I pray that you would humble us and show us our hurts and pains. And we'd cry help and we receive the help that you've given us in your son. I pray that we'd come, come to the end of ourselves and receive the hope that's only in Jesus Christ. As that in Jesus' powerful name, amen.